What's up and welcome to another episode of the Grindline Podcast. You are listening to episode 197. I am here tonight with Tyler. Ryan is, I don't know, either breaking down or rebuilding part of his house right now. And where the Red Wings world is in pain. But how are you doing tonight, Tyler? Well, I would like to say I'm doing fine. Um, as a person, as a person, you're as a fine. person, I, I've been better. This warm weather has really kicked up my allergies. Like I actually missed the last couple of days of work. Um, I had no voice. And then today I kind of let my boss know. And she's like, well, we don't want you here. So just work from home. So I wasn't at work at all yesterday. And then today I worked a little bit from home. So um, getting better. I think I sound a lot better than I did yesterday. But that's what happens when you stop taking your allergy medicine and you think you're out of the woods. Most of the time you're not. So, yeah, I um, I was in the same boat. I lost my voice one day last week. And then for like four days, I couldn't breathe. So that's where I was at with that. But we do have a lot to talk about tonight and not a lot of good stuff to talk about. I mean, there was like one good game since we recorded last and that was against the Minnesota Wild. But I kind of want to start off the top. Do you want to start with the Michael Rasmussen suspension? Absolutely. Yeah. So Michael Rasmussen was suspended in the uh, for a high stick against David Krejci which apparently, and Ryan was very, very upset about this. Krejci went off holding his shoulder, Um, but apparently Rasmussen got suspended for a high stick there. And before the, now I I get it. They're trying to stop dangerous hits to the face, but they did nothing about Forbort's flying hit to Joe Valeno right to his face. Didn't call a penalty on it. There was no review. There was no fine. There was no suspension, but Michael Rasmussen, on a follow through because I, he didn't maliciously hit him in the face on a follow through hit David Krejci in the face with his stick. And Krejci, like we said, went off holding his shoulder. So I, I don't like it. I mean, I get why they did it, but if you're going to do it, you got to be fair and it's got to go both ways. Yeah. I think it's total bullshit. I think it's, it's, it's more of the league uh, stepping in where they don't need to step in. You don't need to, to suspend someone for a, quote unquote, dangerous high stick. It's a bunch of bullshit. Um, You can tell when someone is trying to hit someone in the face, which most of the time I would say never happens. Uh, I guess you could have a weird occasion where someone swings their stick and ends up hitting someone in the face. But that's like, you know, super rare. You don't see that happen every single day. Um, And then, you know, like I said, I mean, he hit the guy and or he hit was it Krejci? And then he went to like kind of get his stick back, you know, to establish himself back on the ice. And uh, I'm not saying he fell, but like, you know, he's trying to bring his stick back around and he got him in the face. Worthy of a penalty? Absolutely. Worthy of a two game suspension? Are you fucking kidding me? So that happened. Those kind of plays happen all the time where you just accidentally. Now, if it was malicious, like Evgeny Kuznetsov hit Kyle Burroughs in the he two handed slapped him in the face with his stick. Like, and then when Burroughs was on the ground, he like cross checked him in the back. That was malicious. And he got suspended for one game. Right. That's malicious. That's dangerous. That's intent to injure. That's all that stuff. That what what happened with Krejci was incidental. Um, I talked to even a lot of Bruins fans that like I was at the game and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's just one of those plays. It's unnecessary. I understand you have to call the penalty because the sticks above the shoulders. And you got the guy in the face. So, of course, that's a penalty. But then David Krejci's over there holding his shoulder, not holding his face. Like, give me a fucking break. This is what we talk about when it comes to consistency uh, with George Peros and with the, with the Department of Player Safety. It makes absolutely no sense. And most of the people in the building, okay, yeah, it's a penalty. Most of the people in the building didn't find that egregious, intend to injure, anything like that. Um, so that's just absolute bullshit. And then you talked about Valeno getting hit in the head. It was, I don't care if it was an elbow or if it was a shoulder, you can't target the head. That's exactly what happened when Valeno was hit by Forbort. No penalty on the play. Uh, it's another dangerous hit, it's a, a hit that the league is trying to get rid of, or so they say they're trying to get rid of. And then there's no penalty on the play. So I, I, I just don't get the, the inconsistency of the Department of Player Safety. And um, it just seems like, and, and I, I don't mean to sound like one of those people, but it seems like the Department of Player Safety just kind of picks and chooses who they want to suspend and who they don't. And that's not right. 
I'm not saying that you're going to suspend everyone for every hit to the head because some go unnoticed and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, the ones that are blatant got a call. You got to call the penalty on the play and you got to at least look at it for a hearing. And I, again, like I've always told you guys, I like the physicality in the game. I think the physicality is what brings a lot of people in to watch the sport itself because it's unlike most of the other sports where it's physical, there's fights, but but um, more than anything, you know, the physicality is a huge part of the game. I don't want to lose that. But also, you don't want to see guys, you know, getting hits to the head. A shoulder to shoulder hit, shoulder to chest hit, fine. The hit to the head, you got to call that. Yeah, and it kind of also goes along with that the the fact that the officiating has been absolutely awful this season. Uh, either they are calling literally every single little thing that happens, or they call absolutely nothing. The Wings have kind of fell victim to that. They had seven penalties against the Boston Bruins. They had what I thought I saw six against Buffalo last night. And granted, their penalty kill has been good. They only allowed one power play goal against the Sabres. But we have to stop taking penalties. And if you don't tighten it up, you're going to get called, it seems like, pretty much on everything. Because that's the way officiating has gone. And and it's made some games one-sided. I know a lot of Toronto fans are also complaining about officiating. The The Leafs suck this season so far. They're doing just as good as we are, which is not great. But I think that if you find yourself in a situation where you are getting called all the time, you have to be even more careful. And it just seems like the wings, they get down by a couple, they get frustrated, and then they just start taking stupid penalties. Yeah, you can't, you can't do it. You can't do it. That's the difference. I mean, we talk about turnovers, how those end up in your net. You saw last night that the one ended up in the net. Penalties are another thing. You can't put teams like Boston and teams like Tampa and teams like Toronto on the power play five and six and seven and eight and however many times on the power play because they're going to make you pay at least 30 to 40 percent of the time. Um, it, you know, in Boston's case, there was three for six on the power play. And, you know, th- they just are undisciplined. That's what we talk about on Twitter, um, you know, how they're doing and all this other stuff. They don't do much well right now. I'll tell you what they do well is take fucking penalties. That's what they do very well. They're taking a lot of penalties. They took a lot against Buffalo last night, took a lot against Boston. I don't believe they took that many against the Wild on Saturday, did they? No, and we won that game. So, And exactly, there's a common denominator. You can't take penalties against teams, especially, like, like think about Minnesota, right? They have Kirill Kaprizov and all these great hockey players. You can't put that team on the power play. They had one power play opportunity. They went for 0 for 1 in the Minnesota game. And Detroit had two and scored on one of them, and there's your difference in the hockey game. Yeah, and last time we talked, I mean, we had the second best penalty kill in the entire league, and we have dropped to 15. So we're at an 80% kill percentage currently. We have it's third, we've killed 30 and have six power play goals against. So we're at 80%. Yeah, one thing I've noticed a lot is they're running around a lot. They're not they're not playing that that typical diamond or the typical small or large box. They're running around, they're they're not. They're not doing what you're supposed to do. I mean, if you watch the Buffalo game last night, they Buffalo dominated the power play. They were just slinging it around and snapping it around and doing whatever they wanted and getting Tage Thompson wide open. And by the way, can you cover that guy? He's not Wayne Gretzky over there or Alex Ovechkin over there. Yes, he has a great shot. What did he have, a six-point night last night against Uh, the Wings? Five or six, yeah. Five or six, a hat trick, nonetheless. You can't cover that guy? Or at least you can't you can't sit on him and and make a guy like I don't know um, what's the other w- winger over there the Swedish winger for for the uh, the Sabers Victor Olafson you can't make him beat you instead of Tage Thompson their best player arguably I mean come on man I'm I look at it and I say okay you, the the power kill which is what they call it which is where you're very aggressive on the penalty kill to try to get the puck and either spring your forward for a shorthanded goal like they did with Dylan Larkin against Buffalo or to get it and get it out real quick and keep it out. And you're just constantly on them, constantly on them. But if you can't match the speed of the team, that's not going to work. 
So Buffalo was faster than them. That was the problem. Now, uh, the other thing that helps is Rasmus Dahlin has been amazing this season so far. Uh, like you said, Tage Thompson started the season well. He's got a new contract, so he's playing high. But, I mean, I think almost half his points on the season came against Detroit in that one game so far. So you can't give, and granted, Buffalo is supposed to be a better team this season. They've got a lot of really, really young talent that's supposed to be very good. They've gotten good lottery picks, and and it's working for them. But those are the teams where maybe you need to play a more defensive-style penalty kill instead of trying to attack, attack, attack if you don't think you can keep up or you don't think you can match the skills of the guys who are on the penalty kill. So I think that's one thing that kind of has been biting them in the ass a little bit, like going from third best or second best penalty kill to 15. That's a pretty drastic drop in four games. So we knew it would kind of come back down to earth because you can't stay at a hundred percent for the entire season, but it needs to, they need to just stop taking so many penalties because their kill is good. You should just never put yourself on the kill that many times. Yeah, you can't, you can't be in a situation like you're putting those teams on the power play. They're going to make you pay. And, and like I said, I mean, the, the common denominator of being a good team versus being a bad team is, is special teams. I mean, kill more than kill more power plays than that you can. And then, you know, obviously get score on the opportunities that you're presented on the power, play, or at least what 25% of them, that's a really good power play. So that's pretty much my thoughts on the whole situation. Falling from five to 15, I mean, is kind of inexcusable. Like I said, they're running around a ton. They're not being disciplined and they're making, letting guys like Tage Thompson beat you. And the other thing too, Pasternak beat them too. And so did Marchand. So it, it's the Boston game and, and the Buffalo game are kind of similar because they got their asses kicked in both of them. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. The power play kind of went the same way too. We were not super great in the power play. When we talked last, we were at 20%. We dropped to 18.75, six power play goals on 32 chances. That's not good. And that's one thing that coach Lalone said. He said, the special teams have been the factor. And if we're going to be bad on special teams, we're not going to win. And he said, the special teams had been not good. So it's, it's that kind of thing that the Red Wings, he's even said they they don't have the stars. They don't have that high-end talent. So they're going to have to make it up in other areas if they want to win. One of those areas is stay healthy, which they can't fucking do. I mean, you're missing Verona. You're missing Bertuzzi. Rasmussen was suspended. You're miss Sonny was out. Gabry's out. Wallman's out. Pissick's out. That's like, it's like nine people. That's all, like almost a whole starting lineup is out. And you can't have, you can't go down that much, like missing two of your top or three of your top nine. Or, I mean, Sonny plays on the fourth or third, but you can't go down that many people and then expect to just still dominate play or be that aggressive. You've got to kind of, of change your, your special team structure in order to match the, the output that you think you're going to have by missing those players. And it's just, it's not happening. So that kind of was ugly. And that started in the Boston game. And you were at the Boston game and I had to turn it off. Um, they played well for the first period. Was it period and a half? First and two periods. Apart. Yeah. So it's the classic Red Wings third period collapse is still happening. And I don't know if it's just they win themselves and then they just fall apart and they're slow and they're not put together. But it was it was going well. And then the whole thing just collapsed. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with the penalty that they had. I think they, they had a five on three. Marshan scored on it to start the third period. And then Craig Smith scored right away, and then Pasternak scored, and that was pretty much it. I mean, they just can't do that. They can't go into the situations where where they they play a good, solid two periods. And I know they got outplayed, but you know, and there Boston's was a really good team, uh, unbelievably good. So somehow, right somehow that team's just never going to suck, which is just horrible for me because, again, like I said, I can't get a win there. Other than the Jimmy Howard win, um, uh, I want to say it was like 2018 where he tried to fight, uh, or Bertuzzi and Marchand tried to fight, and then uh, Howard tried to fight Marchand. Remember that at center ice? It was like a melee. At center yeah, ice. yeah. There's a brawl. 
so there was that game, and then there was last year's game that Detroit won one to nothing. It was the most boring game ever. Boston had a million chances, and Ned stole the show. But um, yeah, no, the the Wings can't win in Boston for whatever reason. I don't know if I'm the curse or if if it's just one of those places that. Detroit has trouble in kind of like Philadelphia. They had the trouble in Philadelphia for all those years. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of those situations where they need to be better um, on the road, too. I mean, they got blown out last night, too. So it's not just a Boston problem. It's 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 a problem. And this is starting to turn into a problem as well, getting blown out. Like you can't you, you got to lose games one to nothing or two to one or three to two. You can't be losing games five to one and eight to three and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not good enough. It's not good enough. Yeah. And it's not helping Alex Adelkovich's case either. Now people were screaming for his head and they say he's garbage and he's a backup. He needs to be traded. But the thing I don't think a lot of people are looking at is sure. Huso is winning, but Ned is starting more on the road. He's getting more high danger shots, more uh, in tight goals down low in that Buffalo game, I think three of the goals were right down in the near the crease and no one was clearing the puck out. So Ned, although he has not been great, I mean, he's had 155 shots against with a 871 save percentage and a 496 goals against. That's bad. But the guys are not playing in front of him. And I don't know if that's uh, they're not doing super well on the road or they're just giving him the harder matchups. And they are. Those are the things that are happening he needs to be able to make some of those key saves. And it seems like once one or two of them go in, it's, it's just a huge collapse. Whereas Billy Huso, I think let in one uh, in the Minnesota game, let in his first goal on like the first four shots or something, and then stop all the rest of the shots, the rest of the game, he bounced back. And I don't know if that's Ned's problem is that the bounce back is not there this season, but it, it needs to tighten up because Ned is not as bad as his stats say he is right now, but the defense needs to work in front of him. And our defense is looking a lot like last season's defense. And that's not good. Yeah. I think we need to get into a situation too, where somebody just takes the reins and is a starter. And then unless it's, oh, I think for backs, sure it's going to be Huso. Yeah, I, I think so too. And that's kind of where we're trending to, towards at this point. So, I mean, unless Ned, really kicks it in the ass the next couple games that he gets in there. I think, you know, it's going to be who sows net until Ned takes it away from him. Um, so, and, and that may not happen because, you know, we talked about this for a while. Billy Huso was thought about as the future goaltender for the St. Louis blues. And then, you know, a guy named Jordan Bennington kind of literally came out of nowhere and became, you know, the starter and won the Stanley cup. And you all know the whole story, but yeah, I mean, the, the basically they need to be a lot more consistent from top to bottom, but mostly when Ned's in net because they've been horrible defensively when Ned's in net. And I know a lot of people want to blame it on Ned, and we can blame it on Ned somewhat. I don't want to blame the whole thing on him because it's not totally his fault. But I will say one thing. They don't defend as well when Ned's in the net versus when Huso's in the net. And that's I don't know if that's a coaching problem. I don't know if that's just a mindset that they have. I don't know if that's because we have guys like Bertuzzi out of the lineup and Verona out of the lineup and Sunquist and Rasmussen and so on and so forth. But the excuse making has to be over. This has to be a team that that can just find another gear and dig deep. Yeah. And I was going through, I kind of wanted to compare last season's start to this season's start. So last season, we went four, three, and two through nine, allowed 31 goals and scored 29. This season, we're 4-3-2 and two through 9, allowed 32 goals and scored 28. So it's almost identical. We've allowed one more goal than in the first nine games this season than last, and we've scored one less goal in the first nine games uh, this season than last. And that is missing all those key players that I stated earlier that we are missing. So you would think that once Verona comes back, once Bertuzzi comes back, once Fabry comes back, Sonny should be back. I think he's good. Rasmussen's not suspended anymore. He he did his games. But my if you look at getting those guys back in the lineup, then you got a much deeper team. Then you're working a little better. It didn't help, I think, that Bergren was injured also in Grand Rapids, that we've had like zero update. He is back now, but the whole time he was injured, there was zero update on him. They had to bring in Giovanni Smith. They had to bring in a um, Matt Luff to fill in instead of bringing in a Bergren to 
to maybe replace some of that scoring or replace some of that playmaking from a missing Verona or a missing Bertuzzi. So yeah, we started the season with good depth, but depth is only good if maybe one or two people go down, not when like five people go down and we're not that deep. And a lot of teams aren't that deep, but Smith played well. I thought he didn't take any stupid penalties. He wasn't a detriment on the ice. I mean, Matt Luff was there. He took a wicked puck to the mouth and missed some teeth and got 16 stitches. I think that if if Bergeron would have been healthy, this may have been a little different story. If Verona Bertuzzi are in the lineup, you maybe don't lose three to eight. You maybe don't lose uh, to the Boston Bruins five to one. And if you look at the games we lost too, I mean, the Bruins, if it weren't for that third period, if we would have played the third period, like we played the first and the second, we might have won that game. I mean, we had a uh, Corsi team Corsi of 51 nine. We controlled the puck more than the Bruins did that game. As opposed to Buffalo, we had a team Corsi of 31.9. Buffalo dominated that game and it was embarrassing. And it just looked like the guys were floating around, didn't care, gave up. I just, the team is very Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You don't know what team you're going to get on what night. Uh, save for guys like Larkin, Lucas Raymond scoring his first two goals and almost getting a hat trick like six inches off an empty net at the end of the game. I mean, Raymond's putting it in now. Larkin is putting it in every game. That's just who Dylan Larkin is. Dominic Kubalik is still owning the ice. Cider has had offer on times, but for the most uh, part, he's been really good. Olimata has been way more than we could have asked for out of Olimata. But then you've got guys like Haig, who's out there just throwing the body and doing dumb shit. You've got Gustav Lindstrom, who was scratched a game in favor of Jordan Osterley, who I thought Osterley played better than him. I mean, it's your defense. Your first pairing of Schrott and Cider is going to be solid. Oli Mata is good. Philip Peronik's on another fucking planet. But if you've got three good defensemen and then three that are going to be a liability, that's not going to going to make for a good time. So when you're looking at this, these Corsi numbers against Buffalo, like I said, 31 nine against Minnesota, Minnesota controlled the puck more, but we won the game. Uh, Boston 51 nine and, and we lost New Jersey six to we lost six to two 38 four for a Corsi. They dominated that game. So. I think it's just it, it it points to an effort issue between games. That Buffalo that sorry, that New Jersey game, let's just go back to that for a second. That was one of the worst games I've seen in a long time. They couldn't make a pass. That every time they had a chance to shoot it, it would roll off their stick or they'd miss the net. Um they'd hit the, the you know the high glass like they were just fucking horrible in that game they really were and then like yeah you talk about like the boston game and you talk about some of these other blowouts where if they would just have a strong third period they wouldn't be down but the difference between a good team and a bad team is consistency and so right now we're a bad hockey team um going back to you you talking about the defense i don't understand at this point what we're doing with phil peronic that he is just absolutely miserable making stupid ass decisions, turning the puck over the, the gap controls bad. He gets burnt. Like, I, I don't know where you go anymore with him. At the beginning of the season, I had said, you need to get Philip Hronick a defensively responsible partner. And they got him Oli Mata and Oli Mata has been far better than Philip Hronick has been. And it hasn't helped Hronick at all, which is what is really concerning. But the other concerning issue is we really don't have any right defensemen in the AHL that are ready to go. So either someone's going to have to play their offside and you're just going to have to deal with the Hronick contract for another year. Or, I mean, there's, there's not really anything else you can do unless you make a trade for maybe another defenseman that needs a change of scenery, because do you think it's a change of scenery thing? Or do you think it's just that bad? I think that he's just getting worse and worse. I don't, I don't see him progressing. I think he's regressing, if anything, which is tough to see because you know, remember with the the uh, the COVID year, he, um, you know, the year after COVID, I should say, uh, that shortened season before he came over to North America, he was lighting it up in in the Czech Republic league, and then he came to the NHL and he he started out well and it kind of fizzled off. He hasn't really gotten back on the horse since then. It's been worse and worse and worse and worse. And he's making $4.4 million to do what? To turn the puck over? I mean, I would rather see... I, I was thinking that Ben Sherratt would be the guy that I couldn't stand. Ben Sherratt has been a surprise, I think. I think he's been pretty good out there with Cider, who 
I don't think Cider's game has been as good as last year just yet, but you know, that is to be expected with a young player. I think it will get better. I think it has gotten a little bit better. Um, but yeah, Haig and Lindstrom, both of them, you got to ask for more from those guys. Um, at some point, maybe you see Edmondson. I know a lot of people have talked about, you know, you, you talk about the off wing or the, sorry, the, the offside. I mean, Put one of the veterans like Oli Mata on, on the right side, put, put Edvinson on the left, and let's see what it looks like. I mean, I'm not saying I want to push that panic button just yet, but I think we're getting close and close to that, closer and closer to that point where if these guys can't do their job, then you're going to have to bring someone in that will do his job. Because I think last time I checked, Edvinson was playing pretty well in Grand Rapids. Yeah, and I think Edvinson got hurt too. He got hit up high. Uh, in one of the last games too, so, oh, so I don't know if he's out. Then I don't know if he's out, but he did leave the ice uh, when he was hit. So we, we got to reach out to our boots on the ground there in, in in Grand Rapids. Get Brandon and Van Andel stat. Let him get him <laughs> in there. Get him in the locker room. Uh, but yeah, Ben Sherratt's another one. I mean, he's been for for what Ben Sherratt for all the people that bitched about Ben Sherratt and say he's awful. He's going to be the worst addition to the team. It was such a bad contract. He cleaned up his penalties. Ben Sherrod has not taken a penalty a game. He's not taking two penalties a game. He's laying people out. He's making space and he's opening up the ice and he's clearing the puck. I had posted a video clip uh, of, of Ben Sherrod's play where not only did he kill three ducks in a row, but he also helped clear the ice. That's, that's what he's there to do. So Ben Sherrod has been good. And I don't know if that's just Ben Sherratt improving his game or if that's Cider making Sherratt better because Cider is also a very good defenseman. But you've got a guy like Philip Bronick is has the second most ice time on the team. Most Cider's got 21 minutes and 55 seconds average. Uh, Philip bronick has got 21.51. He's a plus four and he's got six points on the season so far. But the mistakes that he makes are glaring mistakes. And they're badly timed and they are costly. And he tries to do too much with the puck. Yeah, maybe get a little bit flashy, but that's what a lot of the team is doing. A lot of the team is trying to get really flashy. I don't care if you're one of those guys like like Cider. OK, he made a mistake last night and turned the puck over behind the net that led to that Buffalo goal. Like. You can teach that. But to a guy like Philip Peronic, you shouldn't have to teach that. At 24 years old, you shouldn't have to te- teach someone to not be too flashy. When when things aren't working well, y'all know in hockey, it's one of those sports where you simplify the game and, and you just get the puck deep or you get the puck to your forwards and, and live to fight another day. It can't be a situation where you hold on to the puck, you turn it over, and now the other the puck's going the other way. Or, or you know, in, in Buffalo's case last night, the wings couldn't get the puck out of the zone to save their ass. So um, that that's another part of, of concern, you know, in, in terms of the defense as well. They're not moving the puck quite as well as we thought they would. Yeah. And I think it goes back to also a lot of the team luck. So if you look at the PDO score against the Buffalo Sabres in that game, it was a 97.5. That means the Red Wings were unlucky during that game and we got blown out. During the Boston Bruins game, the PDO was 95.7, meaning the Red Wings were playing under pretty far under where they should have played and got, I I wouldn't call the Boston game a blowout, but they lost five to one. The Minnesota game where we won two to one, our PDO was 100.8. That is the kind of game the wing should be playing on a nightly basis. That's the kind of game they have the talent to play, which is that 2-1 win to Minnesota. And like I said, if you've got guys like like Verona back and you get guys like Bertuzzi back, you should be closer to playing those style games. But this is going to be a really rough stretch until they guys like that come back. And you've got guys that dominate. You've got Dylan Larkin, 11 points on the season, 11 points in nine games, nine, uh, five goals, six assists. Dominic Kubelik, 11 points in nine games, four goals, seven assists. Dylan Larkin has a 20% shooting percentage right now. Dominic Kubelik has a 20% shooting percentage right now. David Perron, 25% shooting percentage. Adam Ernie, 22.2% shooting percentage. Those are going to fall down. So the guys that need to bump theirs up, like a Pia Suter, 8.3 needs to come up. Lucas Raymond's been better lately, but a 9.5 shooting percentage. Those need to bump up a little bit because the guys that are shooting 20% or 25% or 22%, they're probably going to bump down a little bit. And when they do, your secondary scoring needs to take over. So 
Larkin, though he is the captain, though he pushes himself every night and he busts his ass and he's going to try to take those games over, it's not going to be able to happen every night. So you need to get those secondary scoring guys rolling so that you're not losing five to one or you're not losing eight to one. And maybe you're losing if your defense improves four to three, or four to two or, or five to three. You need to score a little bit more. Yeah, I, I need to see more from Andrew Kopp. That's another guy that that I just haven't seen enough from. I know he's coming back from an injury, but um, some people are starting to compare it to the whole Stephen Weiss deal. I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't yet. either. Um, I think Kopp is a better player than Weiss was. But, I mean, you know, he's, he's got to play better. He's got to make better decisions. I know some people have said put him on the wing, get Valeno in the middle. I'm not against that. I think Valeno – has really, I think he's progressed a lot. I really do. I think yeah. the, the the numbers aren't there just yet. But, I mean, if he could play on a second line or a third line, I mean, the sky's the limit. He's not afraid to be physical. He's fast. You can see his hands are good, and his decision-making is good. So I'd like to see a little bit more of Valeno, and I think you saw that last night in, in when the game became a one-goal game against Buffalo when it was 4-3 after they were down 4-1. Derek Lalone liked Valeno out there and he put him in between Raymond and, and Perron, I believe it was. So um, I I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more of that. I, I know some people have, have kind of soured on Valeno and think maybe he's only a, a third or fourth line center. But I mean, hey, you know what? Some players come out of the woodwork and, and if there's an opportunity and he seizes it, then so be it. Yeah, and he's still young too. I mean... And a person that keeps falling down. Okay, I'll go back to Andrew Kopp really quick. You got to think Andrew Kopp. Now people use the Brad Marchand comparable. Brad Marchand and Andrew Kopp are not the same kind of player. So it's not really a comparable. Andrew Kopp had that core muscle surgery. He missed all of training camp. He missed all of preseason. He's getting used to new players and a new system and new teammates and a new coach. So it's going to be an adjustment period for him. And I think if he had that training camp time, if he had that preseason time, he'd be a little bit further along right now. But I agree. Andrew Kopp needs to step it up. Uh, you know who really needs to step it up? If Philip Zadina doesn't score a goal in the next five games, we're in pretty deep trouble there. And I don't see him lasting past the trade deadline. And I think it'll be that kind of... Now, maybe that's where you get your right defenseman. Maybe you can find a defenseman somewhere that is having a tough time on his team and needs a change of scenery and you do that. But Philip Zadina... He's not scoring goals. He's not getting assists. Granted, he he can make plays and he digs the puck out and in that. But that right now, with the way the team is performing, that's not enough. Um, but I want to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor before we move on to the next subject. And I'll let you get in your Zadina thoughts right after this. Hockey fans, it's finally time to hit the ice again. And thanks to DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you're in for the season of a lifetime. New customers can bet $5 on any team and get $200 in free bets if they win. If that wasn't enough excitement, you can turn small bets into bigger payouts with same game parlays. You like Dylan Larkin this season, maybe you think he's going to score a bunch, help you win. You can use things like that, combining multiple bets like which team will win, how many goals will be scored, and more for your shot at an even bigger payout. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. You can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, use promo code THPN, bet $5 on any NHL team to win their game, and get $200 in free bets if they do. That's code THPN at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. So, Tyler, I lamented on Philip Zadina. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so first of all, I want to go back to Cop for a second. Um, we talked about Cop and, and how he hasn't played well. The other thing I kind of wonder is he's starting to feel a little bit of pressure since he's played. He's playing at home. Uh, he's playing in his home state. I know some some players love it, and some players think it's the greatest thing ever, and some players, uh, you know, have regrets right away. Uh, and and you know that's one thing that I wonder. I know uh, I, I remember listening to Bill Guerin talk on on another podcast talking about how he came back home to Boston for one year and how he wanted to get out as soon as possible because it was just a lot of pressure. He had some family pressuring him for tickets and this and that. He couldn't just go out there and play. So I wonder if that's something that, that could be affecting Andrew Kopp. Um, hopefully it's something that he can overcome, but, you know, it's just something to keep an eye on, I suppose. Um, you know, and, and obviously he's got some players on the team. Uh, is he the only, is him and Larkin the only Michigan guys on the team now? 
at this point. Yeah, because De Kaiser was the other one. De Kaiser and Greg Van Denning were the other ones, and yeah. they're both obviously gone. Um, but you have um, you have Ned that's from Parma, Ohio, which isn't that far. Um, but yeah, anyways, going to to the Zadina point. Yeah, I mean, the, we're getting to the point where the rubber needs to meet the road, and the the, the light the lamp needs to be lit. Otherwise, he's going to have to take a seat because he's not doing much other other than you know it, being out there. He's kind of there right now. He's not he's not producing. Uh, once in a while, he makes a nice play. Um, I just I wonder if the confidence is just shot to the point where it's got it's got to be it's got to be done in a different city. I wonder if it's just one of those situations where you you don't want to trade him just yet, but is it a situation where you sit him down and and have him watch a game? And see if if that can kind of motivate them, or is it something where you try to seek a trade? Because it doesn't seem to be getting better. It really just doesn't. No, and you also don't want to trade him for nothing. That's the other half of it. You don't want to say, oh, well, just give us a fifth round pick for Philip Zadina and call it a day. And then he gets that change of scenery and he gets hot and goes and scores a million goals and you regret it. You want to kind of get, like I said, a guy who's maybe in the same kind of situation as Zadina where he's having trouble on his team and things aren't going as well and he should be scoring more because he's got all the talent, but just the this pressure and the situation is is weighing on him. So I think it could be the same kind of situation there. And then maybe you do a one-for-one one swap, but right now he's not really he's not really doing much of anything out there. But I kind of want to get to the positives. I would almost rather see Berger and come up and, and fill that spot to be honest. And that I agree. And and I, I think that may end up happening depending on on what happens going forward, but we'll have to wait and see. But there are positives. People are coming back from injury. So if we look forward to who is injured currently and who will be coming back. So we have Bertuzzi and and uh, Verona that we don't really have a timeline on. Yeah, well, Bertuzzi is going to, I think it was his was six weeks. Uh, for his hand, so that will that we still got time on that. Robbie Fabry is sometime around the new year, so we still have two months on there. Pissick's the same, but Jake Wallman is middle uh, scheduled for middle of November. So Jake Wallman, we should get back around then, so maybe a couple weeks from now, and then that might help improve the defense. That's the hope there. Well, in, th- in terms of depth, you, you get Rasmussen and Sunquist coming back. Are they coming back the next game on Thursday against Washington? One, at least one of them is because Giovanni Smith was sent back to Grand Rapids. So okay. I know so Rasmussen, Rasmussen, I'm assuming, will be yep. back 100%. And then yep. Sunquist could be like a game time decision or something something like that. The, the one thing that I, I look towards at this point, um, you know, as long as, as Bergeron can stay healthy in GR, I mean, at what point do you, do you just say, you know what, let's, let's give it a shot because, you know, you can't fall too far out of this because then, you know, it, it's going to be another situation where you might as well just continue to lose. And that's not what this season was about. I, I'm going to reiterate that right now. That's not what this season was about. The last couple seasons were about losing and about, you know, making the young guys better and this and that, the other thing. That's not what this season, that's not what we signed up for here. This season was a season to improve, to be better, to challenge for a playoff spot. This is not a season to be tanking for Connor Bedard. I don't care how good Connor Bedard is. This is not the type of season that you want to have, and this is not acceptable, quite frankly. So they need to they need to uh, be much better. Yeah. So back to Bertuzzi, out four to six weeks, and he was out on the nineteenth. So he's out. I mean, depending. So on the high end, he could be back in maybe a couple weeks. Uh, are on the low end a couple weeks on the high end you've got them back probably mid December or early December so it, it's going to be a little bit of of time there too but yeah you're right you can't tank because the Red Wings have terrible luck in the draft lottery so you're not guaranteed to win anything and for all the people online they're saying oh trade Dylan Larkin he's one of the only people performing consistently on a nightly basis uh in in scoring points so why would you trade dylan larkin right now yeah the other thing is too when you're healthy you're a pretty damn good hockey team that like there's like we don't know when verona is going to come back but bertuzzi coming back will certainly help the first line it'll certainly help putting everything back together um you know rasmussen and sunquist coming back that will certainly help 
Um, I don't know if that helps the defense, to be honest with you, but I mean, well, that's... Wallman, Wallman coming back should help the defense. Okay. So then that, that helps the defense and then you get Fabry back and then you have a decision to make because you're not really sure what to do with everybody else. And that, that could open up the, to the chance for Zadina to get traded or to, for Fabry to get traded. So there's, there's a lot of different moving pieces here, but like I said, when, when constructed together and when, when they're, you know, a hundred percent healthy or at least 95% healthy, they're going to be a pretty good hockey team. It's just one of those situations where you got to get to that point and they're, you got to kind of tread water until you get to that point. Then you can kind of take off a little bit, um, kind of similar to the teams, you know, that used to be good that would make the playoffs and, and challenge for Stanley cups. Obviously we're not there yet, but we could be a team that treads water and, and pushes for a playoff spot. And that's kind of what we're hoping for at this point. Yep. So up next on the third, we have the Washington Capitals on the fifth, the New York Islanders on the sixth, the New York Rangers and on the eighth, the Montreal Canadiens. There's only one away game in there, and that is against the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. There are winnable games in there. I think the Montreal game is winnable, even though um, I mean, Montreal has been doing okay. I think the Rangers game is going to be a tough one. I think the Islanders game is winnable. And even though the Caps still have Ovi, I think the Caps game is winnable. We just got to show up. That's the thing. Show up. Don't take stupid penalties. Uh, Get on the power play, score some power play goals, and get some secondary offense going. Get guys like Soderblom going again. He's got two goals, but he needs to get a couple more, and he needs to play better defense, too. He's another one that I think could be sent to Grand Rapids to work on his defensive game eventually. So if your guys, if your bottom six guys can step up, if cop can get his game going in the next couple and, and start getting some assists or some points or making some better defensive plays, you've already got Kubi going. You've already got Larkin going. You seem to have Raymond going. Now the, the motor could start running here and we could start seeing some really good games. It's just the defense really needs to tighten up and really needs to work on their shit because they're, they're one of the big reasons that we are not winning right now. You know how the defense can tighten up just by keeping by by the offense cycling the puck down low and and kind of I, I hate to use a cross sports reference but kind of you know ball control puck control just not letting the other team possess the puck and, and have a lot of opportunities to score. Um, so if you're if you're going to defend a lot, you're going to give up a lot. Really, I mean, unless you're one of those teams that can just pack it in and block a million shots, I don't see the Wings being one of those teams. So they need to be one of those teams that can cycle the puck down low, get the puck up high, and and get some shots and you know create some opportunities. There's a lot of one and done. I see a lot of one and done where they're they're in the zone for a little bit, and it's it you know it's it, it's out just as quickly as it came in. So it, th- that obviously doesn't help you on defense, but like like I said, I mean they just they, they need to score more. I mean that's that's kind of what it really comes down to. Yep, and I agree, and that's where we're going to end it tonight. But I want to get your final thoughts before we sign off. Yeah, so my final thoughts are, you know, let's just hope that they can come out against Washington and have a strong game, and then have another strong game against the Islanders because the 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 road doesn't get easier here. Then you get the Rangers, then you get the Canadians, then you get the Rangers. Then you get the Kings. Then you get a little break with Anaheim, but Anaheim just beat Toronto. So um, there's no saying much right now. There's no real breaks in the season. I mean, we're not one of those teams that can just say, oh, this team sucks. We're going to win that game. I mean, I would have said that about Buffalo last night, to be honest, and the Wings laid an egg. So um, I I don't know. But the other thing is, too, I, I don't know where we go from here, but I think If we can just be a little bit more consistent, I think we'll start racking up the points, whether that be one point a game or, you know, getting two points every every other couple games. That's that's where they need to be. Um, But those are my final thoughts. And you can follow me on Twitter at SealDog91. Yeah, I'm going to kind of echo the same thing. Like I said earlier, I'll take the overtime losses. The overtime losses mean we were good enough to play with the other team all game. And that still gets us a point. And if you look at the standings right now, the Bruins are in first place with 16 points. The Sabres second with 12, the Panthers third with 11, and then the Lightning Canadians, Red Wings, and Maple Leafs are all tied with 10 points. So we're two points out of second place right now. The Sens are in last with eight points. 
But the Leafs have lost four in a row. They look bad. I'm surprised Sheldon Keith hasn't been fired yet. Uh, but Dubas is not the best GM in the world, and people are already burning their jerseys. So at least we're not at that point. But a couple wins, string together a few wins, the three out of the next five, and you're right back up there with the Bruins towards the top of the standings. So it's really early in the season still, but they need to learn quickly and adapt. And I have full faith in Coach Lalone to be able to do that because he's very pointed with his words. He points out exactly what the problem is. He knows that that's the problem. He's telling people to temper their expectations. And I think we just need to listen to him because he talks a lot like Iserman does. It's the same kind of stuff that comes out of his mouth. That's why Iserman hired him. So it's just be patient, but we we're being patient, but we're also realizing that the team is not performing to the level that they could be performing currently. And there are things to fix. So you can follow me online at bringing the wing. You can follow the grindline podcast online at grindline pod. We like give a shout out to the hockey podcast network for hosting us and spreading our podcast all around. We also like to give a shout out to vintage Detroit, which is the only place you should get your Detroit Jersey jerseys from jerseys. What the fuck's a Jersey, a Detroit jerseys from it's like, I'm talking Boston. Tyler, is that how you say Jersey? Jazzies. Ja- jazzies? Like Jazzy Mikes? Like Jazzy Mikes. Be a sub above. <laughs> so yeah, Vintage Detroit's the only place you should get your Detroit jerseys from and work on. Uh, if you use the promo code GRINDLINE on Howie's Hockey Tape, you can get 10% off your order. If you use that same promo code on Bring Hockey Back, you get 12%. You can check out our merch on redbubble.com by searching The Grind Line. I have a new Redwood shirt up. I think it came out really good, and I actually might order one for myself. And I hope that line sticks because it's funny, and I already made merch for it. So go check out our merch at redbubble.com. But that's going to do it for us tonight. So for Tyler, I am Greg. You stay classy, Hockey Town.